This film explains the working of a typical apparatus designed to deliver a continuous flow of nitrous oxide and oxygen to which ether can be added as required. This diagram shows the general working of the machine. For the sake of simplicity, we are removing the spare cylinders, leaving one cylinder of oxygen and one of nitrous oxide. The carbon dioxide cylinder can also be disregarded, and so can the chloroform bottle, which is often provided. Nitrous oxide is represented here by a white dot. The gas flows from its cylinder through the lead to the flow meter. The symbol for oxygen is a white ring. This also flows to the appropriate flow meter. Here are the two gases flowing together as far as the meters. Next, they pass through their respective flow meters. The rate of flow is adjusted by thumb screws at the bottom of the flow meters. It is indicated by the height of a floating bobbin on a calibrated scale the reading being taken from the top of the bobbin. The nitrous oxide scale is marked in litres to 10 litres per minute, the oxygen in cubic centimetres to 2 litres per minute, and the carbon dioxide in cubic centimetres to 1.5 litres a minute. The oxygen flow meter is fitted with a bypass when the tap is turned on, large quantities of oxygen are delivered under pressure. After passing through the flow meters, the nitrous oxide and oxygen mix. Flow past the ether bottle, past the rebreathing bag, through the corrugated rubber hose to the face mask. Here is the ether bottle in section, with gases flowing past the entrance. This arrow shows the direction of the gases. When ether is needed, the gases are diverted into the bottle, where they pick up ether vapor and carry it with them. A tap on the ether bottle controls this. Here it is turned half on. A portion of the gases continues to flow straight on, the remainder passes through the J-tube in the bottle, picks up ether vapor and rejoins the undiverted gases. Now the tap is full on, and the whole of the gases go through the bottle, carrying ether vapor with them. To increase the concentration of ether vapor still further, a plunger is used. It's attached to a hood, which can be made to slide down over the open end of the J-tube. This forces the gases down nearer to the surface of the liquid ether, so that more is vaporized. When the plunger is right down, the gases bubble through the ether, and the concentration of ether vapor is at a maximum. Here we see the whole machine in action. Nitrous oxide and oxygen are flowing through the ether bottle where they pick up ether vapor and pass on to the face mask. Before you start to give the anaesthetic, you must check the whole apparatus. First, see that the cylinders are connected to the right flow meters. This is the oxygen lead. Follow it up to the oxygen meter. This lead is usually of white rubber. Now do the same with the nitrous oxide. 
The nitrous oxide lead is black. And again the same with the carbon dioxide. This lead is green. Now make sure that the cylinders are full. Don't trust the labels. The oxygen is in gaseous form, so the cylinder is supplied with a pressure gauge, which indicates the contents. Before opening the cylinder, turn on the bypass tap to avoid any sudden strain on the pressure gauge. Turn the full or reserve cylinder key and read the pressure gauge. This confirms that the cylinder is full. Turn off the bypass tap and test the flow meter. Now turn off the cylinder. Next, test the in-use cylinder in the same way and leave it turned on. A pressure gauge would be of no value on the nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide cylinders because the gas is liquefied and the pressure remains the same until the cylinder is nearly empty. Open the spare cylinder and turn the flow meter control until the bobbin rises. Turn off the spare and open the in-use cylinder. Leave this open, but turn off the flow meter. Finally, check the carbon dioxide cylinder in exactly the same way. Ether decomposes in sunlight and in the presence of oxygen into poisonous aldehydes and peroxides and it may become contaminated with chloroform if this has been used in the other bottle. If you are in any doubt, pour it away. In any case, the ether bottle should be emptied not less than once a week and refilled with fresh ether from the stock bottle. The ether bottle is surrounded by a can into which warm water may be poured. The water should be not hotter than 90 degrees Fahrenheit or the ether may boil. As ether is vaporized, it cools and the concentration of vapor falls. This water jacket delays cooling. Now assemble the corrugated rubber hose, expiratory valve and angle piece. Slip the harness ring over the face mask and fit the mask into position. Then adjust the tension of the expiratory valve. Lastly, you should see that the rubber harness is at hand for use later on. You are now ready for the patient. If you feel his pulse before beginning, it'll give you a standard for comparison later. Make sure that he has had the correct premedication and that the record of preoperative examinations is in order. Examine his teeth and see if there's any obstruction to nasal breathing. Place the harness beneath his head to be ready in position when it's wanted.
Turn the nitrous oxide on to a flow of 10 litres a minute. Next, clear the J-tube of any liquid ether. Turn off the rebreathing bag, raise the plunger and turn the ether tap full on. The flow of gas through the J-tube will immediately clear any liquid ether away. Now turn the ether tap off and the bag on again and smell the mask to make sure that no ether vapour is coming through. Lower the mask gradually onto the patient's face. Induction will be slower this way, but much pleasanter. A mask held tightly on the face often produces a feeling of suffocation, which may lead to excitement in the second stage. As the mask touches the face, the rebreathing bag gradually fills. When it's full, the valve blows off at each expiration. The tension of the valve can be adjusted if necessary. A little positive pressure helps at this stage, but may tire the patient if it's maintained too long. The onset of the third stage of anaesthesia is marked by regular and sometimes stertorous breathing, often a sign of lack of oxygen. Now turn the oxygen on to one litre per minute. Provided the airway is clear, this will be sufficient for the five minutes or so until the ether has been brought in. Keep the chin well up and if you put your hand on the patient's throat, you'll be able to feel the vibration of an obstruction that may not be obvious to the ear. Turn on the ether tap a little every three regular breaths. If the regular rhythm of breathing is interrupted by swallowing or breath holding, which you can see on the bag as well as by looking at the patient, turn off the ether. Lift the mask until the ether vapor is washed out of the rebreathing system and then replace it. When the breathing's regular again, you can turn on the ether, as before, a little every three breaths. If you increase the concentration of ether vapor too fast and the patient coughs, turn it off again and remove the mask. You'll waste less time this way than if you persist with the ether and the patient develops laryngeal spasm. Start again with the tap a little short of the setting that produced the coughing and move it up gradually. When the ether tap is full on, you can lower the flow of nitrous oxide by degrees to five litres a minute, without risk of the patient coming up to the second stage. One of the few dangers of nitrous oxide anaesthesia is that prolonged oxygen lack may produce permanent cerebral damage. This setting, with five litres of nitrous oxide to one of oxygen a minute, passing full over the surface of the ether, 
will produce light to moderate anesthesia according to the resistance of the individual patient. And the proportion of oxygen will be sufficient even over a long period. The mask can now be strapped to the face by means of the harness. And the head turned to one side. If the breathing is not quite clear, insert an artificial airway. Provided the cylinders don't run short, the maintenance of anesthesia is more or less automatic and you're free to concentrate on the patient's condition and to take blood pressure and pulse readings, a great advantage when he's seriously ill. For moderate to deep anesthesia, depress the plunger. But remember that there's a sudden increase in ether concentration when the plunger goes below the surface. And this may lead to laryngeal spasm. Turn off the ether and wait until the breathing becomes clear. Take the mask away if necessary. When the breathing's regular again, you can turn on the ether. The patient is now being given a total of six liters of fresh gases a minute. His minute volume is probably about eight liters so that three quarters of what he breathes will be fresh gases and one quarter expired gases. This is called partial rebreathing. The rebreathing bag acts as a reservoir. To show how it works, we'll take each movement of the gases separately. The bag is filled partly by fresh gases from the machine and partly by gases from the hose blown back when the patient exhales. When it's full, the gases from the machine flow past the entrance to the bag down the hose. When the patient inhales, he draws gases from the bag in addition to the constant flow from the machine. As he exhales, the whole cycle starts again. The gases from the machine and those blown up the hose fill the bag. The flow continues down the hose when the bag is full and the patient inhales. Now let's see what happens nearer the patient. When he exhales, the gases in the hose are forced back towards the bag and the hose therefore contains fresh gases in the upper portion and expired gases in the lower portion. These expired gases contain carbon dioxide, which is represented by black dots. Once the bag is full, about halfway through expiration, the remaining exhaled gases pass out through the valve. At the same time, and during the pause before inspiration starts, fresh gases from the machine are coming down the hose pushing still more of the exhaled gases before them through the valve. When the patient starts to breathe in, 
there is about one quarter of the expired gases still left in the hose, and he will inhale these together with the fresh gases from the bag. Now let's see the whole cycle again. The proportion of carbon dioxide breathed in is moderate and at a flow of six liters per minute a reasonable amount of rebreathing is maintained. If however the rate of flow of fresh gases is lowered, rebreathing will increase. As the bag fills more slowly, a higher proportion of the expired gases will pass up the hose and less will be forced through the expiratory valve by the smaller downward flow of fresh gases. When inhalation starts, there will be a larger proportion of expired gases to be breathed in again by the patient with the resultant accumulation of carbon dioxide. Conversely, if the flow of fresh gases is raised, rebreathing will decrease and will cease altogether when the flow is equal to or more than the minute volume of respiration. To sum up, the amount of rebreathing with a flow of six liters of fresh gases a minute is not normally excessive and you should not give less except when for some reason you want carbon dioxide to accumulate. If the patient becomes at all cyanosed, for example because of shallow breathing due to excessive premedication, you must be prepared to raise the proportion of oxygen. A patient who is suffering from shock or anemia must be given at least 20% of oxygen, even if cyanosis is not apparent. To do this, you can raise the flow of oxygen or you can lower the flow of nitrous oxide, thereby producing more rebreathing, carbon dioxide accumulation, and so deeper respiratory excursion. As the anesthesia progresses, the patient's tissues gradually become saturated. After about half an hour, you will find that appreciably less ether is needed from the machine to keep him at the same depth of anesthesia. The cooling of the ether in the bottle results in some falling off in concentration, but you will usually need to turn it partly off. In any case, during the last 15 minutes of most operations, the ether can be turned right off. The nitrous oxide alone will be sufficient to keep the patient from coming round and his reflexes should return within a few minutes of the end of the operation.
This diagram shows the principle of total rebreathing. The patient is given a continuous flow of anesthetic gas, represented by white spots, and oxygen represented by white circles. The gases are inhaled by the patient and exhaled unchanged through the open tap on the bag. The black spots represent the carbon dioxide, which is also exhaled by the patient. We will now show the cycle. Gas and oxygen are breathed in from the bag and the machine. Gas and oxygen and carbon dioxide are breathed out into the bag. Some escapes through the open tap. When the required level of anesthesia has been reached, the flow of anesthetic gas is cut off, the valve is closed, and the patient breathes the same gases to and from the bag. A small flow of oxygen must be given to replace what the patient is using up. But, as you see, when the flow of fresh gases is reduced, the carbon dioxide exhaled by the patient begins to accumulate in the apparatus. This would act as a poison if inhaled for long. To overcome this, a canister of specially prepared soda lime is put between the mask and the breathing bag. This will absorb the excess carbon dioxide. The canister must be large enough to contain all the expired air. Here is one type of canister used. The screw top is fitted with a wire gauze mesh to keep the soda lime in place. Fill the canister with soda lime from a container. It must be packed tight or there will be a space when it's turned on its side through which some of the gases can pass, leading to incomplete absorption. Make sure the canister is airtight by closing one end with the palm of your hand and blowing through the other. Blow through again two or three times to clear out soda lime dust, which is irritating if inhaled. If you pour in a little water, the soda lime will reach maximum efficiency at once. The canister is now ready for use. Put on a strip of adhesive plaster and mark it off in sections. A cross in each section represents one hour's use. You'll get about eight hours absorption from one filling, but it becomes less efficient after two or three hours continuous use, so have a spare canister ready. The canister is placed between the rebreathing bag and the angle piece to which the face mask is attached. The oxygen lead is attached to the angle piece. The rebreathing bag has a tap at the far end through which the expired gases can pass. When the tap is closed, total rebreathing takes place through the canister.
here you see the apparatus fitted on the patient. This single phase apparatus works in exactly the same way as the diagram you've seen. The gas is passing over the soda lime during both expiration and inspiration. Anesthesia is induced with nitrous oxide and ether in the usual way, without the canister. When the required level is reached, plug in the canister. When the bag is filled again, close the tap. Turn off the nitrous oxide and lower the oxygen flow to 300 cubic centimeters a minute. You can leave the ether tap on for 10 minutes to compensate for the loss of anesthetic into the tissues. The oxygen consumption of a patient varies from 200 to 400 cubic centimeters a minute. This is called the basal oxygen flow. The exact figure is reached by watching the rebreathing bag over a period of time. Here the bag is of normal size. If you find that it gradually fills, the oxygen flow is too high and must be cut down. If the bag gets smaller, and there's no leak. The oxygen flow is too low and it should be raised. This is the simplest method of carbon dioxide absorption. It's efficient, but there's a possibility of the patient inhaling dust from the canister if he's breathing very deeply at first and the canister gets very hot from the chemical action. The alternative method is called closed circuit or two-phase absorption. A narrow-bore tube for the fresh gases runs from the flow meters to the Y piece. The rebreathing bag and the canister are attached by two tubes, the corrugated rubber hose, to the Y piece and face mask. At one end of each tube is a directional valve so that the patient expires through one tube and inspires through the other. Various circuits are possible, but this one is common. The fresh gases from the gas oxygen machine flow to the Y piece, as in single phase absorption. The exhaled gases pass along the expiratory hose, over the valve, through the soda lime canister where the carbon dioxide is absorbed, and into the rebreathing bag. On their return path from the bag, the inhaled gases do not go through the canister, but pass over the valve and along the inspiratory hose to the patient. We will now repeat the cycle. As you see, the two phases of respiration are kept separate by means of the directional valves. The gases pass through the absorber only once in each cycle of respiration. The advantages of this method are that the bulky canister is kept well away from the face and the gases have time to cool on their way from the canister to the patient. Here is the model you saw in the diagram, attached to the gas oxygen machine. The fresh gases pass from the flow meters 
through this narrow bore tube. to the Y piece and face mask. On the top of the canister are the directional valves. Here you see them working. An ether bottle is incorporated into the apparatus and placed between the rebreathing bag and the circuit. The flow of gases through the bottle is regulated by this tap. It works like this. When the tap is turned off, the gases pass along the top and don't go through the bottle. When the tap is turned on, the gases pass down one side of this partition, through the wick, the lower end of which dips into the ether, and up the other side to the rebreathing bag. On their return path, the gases again pass through the bottle and into the circuit. As none escapes from the circuit, a high concentration of ether is built up quite rapidly. The expiratory valve can be anywhere in the circuit. This machine has a valve on the side of the canister mount. This dial indicates how many hours the absorber has been in use. Adjust it at the beginning and end of each case. The base of the dial is the absorber tap. This controls the circuit of gases. It moves from off through various intermediate positions to full on. Two circuits are possible on this type of machine. When the absorber tap is turned off, the canister is cut right out. As the absorber tap is turned from off by degrees to full on, increasing proportions of gases are sent through the canister until complete absorption is reached when they're all passing through the canister. When you've filled the canister as before, screw it into place. This canister is fresh, so turn the dial to naught. Turn the absorber tap to off. Now induce anesthesia with nitrous oxide and oxygen in the usual way. The expiratory valve is left open for the first five minutes to wash out the nitrogen contained in the apparatus and the patient's lungs. Introduce the ether gradually. Now close the expiratory valve.
turn off the nitrous oxide and lower the oxygen to your basal level. Bring the canister into the circuit by turning the absorber tap full on. The patient is now fully anaesthetized. Readjust the mask. Add more nitrous oxide and oxygen to fill the bag again. And turn off the ether vaporizer. Turn off the nitrous oxide. And lower the oxygen again to your basal level. Once anesthesia has reached the required depth, it should theoretically remain at about the same level without addition of any more ether. Efficiency in carbon dioxide absorption depends on an airtight fit between mask and face. The best masks have a deep air cushion and are molded to fit the face. Test the mask by harnessing it to the patient's face. Closing the expiratory tap and compressing the bag. This mask is quite airtight. In some cases you may find you can't get a perfect fit with a mask or there may be a leak elsewhere. This mask is leaking. You can retain most of the advantages of the carbon dioxide absorption technique if you use a small continuous flow of gases, say 500 cubic centimeters of oxygen and one liter of nitrous oxide per minute. You will need to add some ether vapor from time to time to keep anesthesia down to the required level. With endotracheal anesthesia, an airtight fit must be obtained by packing the throat tightly around the tube or by inserting an inflatable cuff of the type which can be blown up in the trachea. A useful refinement depends on the fact that if the patient's lungs are overventilated by compressing the rebreathing bag, his alveolar carbon dioxide is lowered below the threshold level and he will remain apneic until it has had time to accumulate. In this diagram, the stimulus represents carbon dioxide and the threshold represents the degree of sensitivity of the respiratory center. The normal depth of respiration is represented by this symbol. We shall leave it in to serve for comparison. When stimulus and threshold are at normal level, the patient is breathing normally. The depressant effect of hypnotic drugs used for premedication raises the threshold above normal and the breathing becomes shallow. After a time, carbon dioxide accumulates, raising the stimulus, but not quite so high as the threshold. A new equilibrium is established with breathing slightly shallower than normal. If, while the threshold is raised by premedication, the stimulus is lowered below normal by overventilation, the patient will stop breathing until carbon dioxide is reaccumulated. We'll 
start with a partial depression due to pre-medication. Deep anesthesia with ether depresses the respiration still further and the breathing becomes shallower. Less overventilation than before will be necessary to lower the stimulus sufficiently for the patient to stop breathing. The stimulus can be kept at this level by overventilation by the anaesthetist. We will again assume the patient has been premedicated. With a very depressant anaesthetic like cyclopropane, the threshold is raised still higher and breathing becomes even shallower. If the stimulus can be kept down to normal by artificial respiration, there will be no spontaneous breathing. This technique, known as controlled respiration, is particularly valuable in upper abdominal and in chest operations, where respiratory movement may sometimes embarrass the surgeon. The carbon dioxide absorption technique has many advantages over the semi-open methods. The inspired gases are warm and moist, and operative shock seems to develop less easily. The more complete elimination of carbon dioxide from the inspired gases gives quieter breathing. As the expired gases do not pass into the air, the diathermy cautery can be used with explosive agents such as ether or cyclopropane. There is, of course, great economy in the use of nitrous oxide and oxygen. <laughs>